The Cannabis Dispensary Spotlight Series is brought to you by Helix Biotrack, the largest seed-to-sale tracking and dispensary point-of-sale software solution in the industry. Since 2010, cannabis dispensaries, cultivation facilities, and manufacturers have trusted Biotrack to securely and confidently keep them in compliance while managing their businesses. With flexible solutions for both THC and hemp industries, customizable workflows, built-in machine learning and data analytics that deliver actual insights to the right people at the right time, it's clear why cannabis companies in 37 states and nine countries depend on Biotrack. For comprehensive cannabis software and business solutions that cover the requirements of compliant seed-to-sale tracking and data reporting in every state, there's really only one choice, Biotrack. Go to Biotrack.com today for secure cannabis software solutions that you can count on. Something that's biodynamic, there's a baseline requirement of using organic inputs to produce that product. However, the inputs have to be sourced locally. And that's what I really like about biodynamic is you can have an organic product, but because there's no requirement on where those inputs come from, it's very possible to have an organic product that has quite a large carbon footprint. From MJ Bulls Media, it's the Raising Cannabis Capital Show. I'm Dan Humiston, and on today's show, we're continuing the Cannabis Dispensary Spotlight Series with another cannabis retail pioneer. Stay tuned for exciting insight into the techniques that this entrepreneur is using to expand and succeed. Today in Raising Cannabis Capital, we are continuing this month's Cannabis Dispensary Spotlight Series with Eric Pearson, the founder and CEO of Spark. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me on, Dan. Well, it's a real honor to speak with you today. Spark has been a pioneering force in the cannabis industry for a long time. And I think the best way to get things started is, and I think it's really important for our listeners, is to get a sense of just how much experience Spark has. When did you open your first dispensary? 2000. 10, I think we started the permitting process in 2008 or so and, and had our doors open in San Francisco in 2010. We're, we're almost into a decade <laughs> of, running, of running dispensaries. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, that was an interesting time. I think that we were still dealing with a lot of federal interference in San Francisco. The letters were being sent out from the federal government's you know, drug enforcement agency and whatnot. So uh, they were trying times, but we've come a long way. You know, I, I first started really in the cannabis industry in 1998 after moving out from Indiana I came out to, to grow cannabis and started s- supplying dispensaries and whatnot in the early 2000s. But it wasn't until 2009, 2010 until we actually uh, had a dispensary. Yeah, I, and when I talk to people about Spark, they always comment on the quality. Going through your bio, I suspect that a lot of your commitment to quality is rooted in your early days back in the 90s when you were working with sick patients and maybe give people a sense of what, what that was like. Yeah, see, I, I think it was 2000 and probably four that I really started situating my business and operations in San Francisco. I came out to Sonoma County in Northern California in 98, quickly ran into law enforcement in in Sonoma County and and realized that San Francisco was a better place to cultivate cannabis. And and so we started growing marijuana indoors in San Francisco and and working politically there with elected officials who were quite a bit more welcoming than, than Sonoma County was at the time. And quickly, one of the, the organizations that I met in San Francisco was a, was an AIDS hospice called My Tree AIDS Hospice. Mm-hmm. And they do a lot of respite care now because folks aren't dying from HIV AIDS like they were in the early 2000s. But we still distribute cannabis to that AIDS hospice today. In the early 2000s, I introduced cannabis to that hospice, I began working with the program director and the nursing staff and some of the doctors on staff, I developed a, a free distribution program where we took cannabis there every two weeks, and we're still doing that today. I think that's one of the reasons why you have such a solid reputation within the industry is because of you know, all that early work that you did and the work that you continue to do. Your company is, like many dispensary chain or operations, or you're really just a vertically integrated organization. 
I find it really interesting, the grow that you have in, I think it's in Sonoma County. You talk about biodynamic cultivation. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to our listeners what that entails? So biodynamic is trademarked term owned by a company called Demeter. So it's a certification, essentially. It's multifaceted, but I think what really differentiates something that's grown biodynamically from something that's maybe just grown organically is it's not just a label that defines the product, but it's also a label that defines the process. The example I like to use is organic is a product that is a label that's put on products that are grown a certain way with certain inputs. Organic's been watered down quite a bit. doesn't mean quite as much as it used to be. With something that's biodynamic, there's a baseline requirement of using organic inputs to produce that product. However, the inputs have to be sourced locally. And that's what I really like about biodynamic is you can have an organic product, but because there's no requirement on where those inputs come from, it's very possible to have an organic product that has quite a large carbon footprint. So let's just use some of the common ingredients for growing cannabis. Peat, for example, may come from Canada on a truck or a trailer all the way down to Sonoma County. And that may be an organic input, but that has a large carbon footprint because it's coming from so far away. Copal fiber from Sri Lanka may come across the ocean, may be organic, but has a very large carbon footprint by the time it gets to you. So that's what I like about biodynamic because you have to source those inputs locally. I want to take a short break to let you listen to a quick preview of our next episode. We have an operator's quota here in British Columbia of eight stores, of which we'll fulfill in the next two months. And then in Alberta, we're rolling out a pretty ambitious expansion plan by way of about 10 development permits that we acquired late last year, of which we'll really focus in on five to eight key A-plus locations. And then Ontario, I think, is the hill that we'll never die on. It's one that we really had a tremendous appetite from the get-go to expand into. And we plan on opening probably 10 to 15 stores there this year. Tune in on Sunday to hear Harrison Stoker from the Hobo Cannabis Company. And now let's get back to today's show. Right now you're at five locations in Northern California? Yeah, we're three locations in San Francisco, one in Santa Rosa, one in Sebastopol. Okay. And then what are your plans? What's what's next on the plate? There's a lot of shiny objects out there. and <laughs> We get you know calls from various states and stuff. I'll, I'll tell you, Manhattan and New York is something that interests me as the state moves forward. For the most part, we've been fairly disciplined, focusing just on Northern California. In order to really capitalize on our vertical, of course, we can't grow product in California and send it over state lines. So we've really been focused on just Northern California. Uh, that's the most creative way to, to grow our business. We're always looking at more retail opportunities, whether through acquisition or management contracts or competing in a competitive process for limited market dispensaries in Northern California, primarily focused right here with what's on our plate right now. It's such a gigantic market. I mean, it's, it's, it's inconceivable that you could fill in all the opening opportunities in that space. And, and even in the short term, there's just so many opportunities as far as the expansion plans, are you going to need to raise capital to do this or are you going to do self-fund it? We've raised some capital and we'll probably raise a bit more here in the spring. We're a profitable business though, so the capital markets are pretty tough right now. Mm-hmm. If, if we can raise that the valuation that we did you know, a year ago, then I think anybody would take that in a heartbeat yeah. because the valuations are, are down so low. But we don't have a super high burn rate. We're profitable, so we're okay. I mean, obviously growth takes more capital. And I see a lot of distressed assets coming online in the next one to two years, I believe, in California. So having the right funding and the right amount of capital to take advantage of some of those opportunities will be a good thing. But we're not in the middle of a round right now. Okay. You did mention earlier that you're keeping your eyes open for locations that maybe want to be acquired or want to work in some sort of licensing operation agreement. That's part of the growth strategy? In some jurisdictions in in California, San Francisco, for example, Santa Rosa, for example, where we are already operate, we'd like to have more locations, but we specifically did not jump into the whole get in line to apply for a new location because we have enough experience in these jurisdictions to realize that putting money out to tie up real estate, to submit a permit and, and wait three years in San Francisco to get your doors open is not the most financially wise way to go about it. So whether it's San Francisco or Santa Rosa, we're going to see 
folks who have spent three years plus waiting to get their doors open and then realizing that these dispensary opportunities are not five, six, seven, eight million dollar a year stores, but they're maybe one or two. You know, being able to take advantage of some of those distressed assets as they come online is a smarter way to go about that. Whether that's through purchasing those opportunities or just managing those opportunities for folks and organizations who didn't quite know what they were getting into when they submitted for a new permit. Those are the kind of opportunities we look to expand into. Well, especially with all your experience running dispensaries and knowing how to do it profitably, that will be very important as you move into this next phase. Well, we've been speaking with Eric from Spark, and you can find all of their information in our show notes or on mjbulls.com. Eric, thanks for being on the show today. Awesome. I appreciate it. Appreciate the time. Today's show was made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, like Alt36, the country's premier blockchain payment processing platform that's providing dispensaries and its customers with a safe and secure payment option other than cash. To learn more, go to alt36.com. Today's podcast was produced by MJ Bulls Media, the industry's premier cannabis podcast network, with original music produced in part by Jamie Humiston. I'm Dan Humiston, and you've been listening to the Raising Cannabis Capital Podcast. Podcast.